Hi, my name is Chris Desitel, and in this video I'm going to be walking you through the process of making a Maloof style rocking chair. The chair gets its name from Sam Maloof, a woodworker who developed this design over many years and became quite famous for it. This is not an instructional video. You're not going to learn how to make a chair like this in a 45 minute video. Rather, the point of this video is to give you an appreciation for the amount of craftsmanship that goes into a chair like this, to give you an appreciation for what makes the chair so special. So, with that in mind, let's get started. Hi, so this is where it begins with the rough lumber. This is sapili. It's an African wood. It's sometimes called African mahogany but that's just a marketing term, it's not really mahogany. It's a close relative though, it's a sibling species if you will, and it looks just like mahogany, and it works just like mahogany, but it's a lot less expensive than mahogany. It's not an inexpensive wood, it's still kind of costly, but mahogany is extremely costly, and mahogany is hard to find in such thicknesses. Uh, this is eight quarter lumber, which means it's two inches thick. The entire chair is made from eight quarter lumber. Now, I've marked up this rather impressive board. It's uh, about 13 and a half inches wide. It's a really nice piece of wood. And I've marked it up for my own guidance um, where I'm going to get some of the parts out of this, this piece of wood. Like, here's an arm right here. There's two of those. The other one right there. Here is this is the uh, rear leg. This is the post that goes all the way up the side of the chair, all the way to the headboard. This is where the arm attaches, this is where the seat attaches. Laid one out right there. There's another one right there. I also have two front legs laid out, and I have the headboard laid out. I might get another piece out of here for the seat. I don't know yet. Um, I say them for my guidance because these marks aren't going to last. They're going to be obliterated very soon. because. The very first thing I have to do is I have to mill this down to all of the lumber. I have to mill it down to exactly one and three quarter inches thick. Perfectly uniform, perfectly parallel. Now, what may, for making you watch me do that would be like watching paint dry, so I'm not going to put you through that. I'm just going to mill this stuff up and then we'll be back for the next steps. So. I have finished milling the lumber, dimensioning it down to a perfect one and three quarter inches thick. And these boards here are the boards that will make up the seat. The seat is the first major component that you build for the chair, the heart of the chair if you will. Uh, when you do sculpted chair seats, it's typical that you use as few boards as possible, two boards, three maybe. But with this chair, we're using five boards, and we have to use five boards, and they are very precisely dimensioned. The reason is this is a coopered seat. Uh, Cooper is a term for barrel making. Coopers, that's the name of the trade. Uh, they make these, you know, round barrels out of wood, and the staves all form up to form a, a perfect circle because the edges of the staves have been beveled. So when pressed together, they just naturally want to form a circle. Uh, we're doing the same thing here. You can see you can see the bevels at work here. Two, two, these facing one direction and these facing in the opposite direction. The reason for that is because of the result we want to get. We don't want this to form a perfectly concave surface. We want it to be a little more sophisticated than that. So when uh, you force it together for the glue up, you'll see these bevels forced into a particular shape. We have we have the center of the chair, a nice the foundation for a nice gentle curve, but the two edges are flat, parallel to the floor. Okay. Some of the other things going on that in this chair include I have cut slots in here for floating tenons. Go right in there like that. Um, Yes, they do increase the strength. They reinforce the strength of the, of the, of the butt joint. But that's not the primary reason I do it. Uh, they do reinforce it. They do add extra strength. But the truth is that's probably not necessary because modern wood glues are so strong that you really don't need these reinforcement bits. But uh, what it does do, besides reinforcing, is it allows a perfect alignment of the glue up. So uh, I get an absolutely perfect glue up with minimal effort. 
no, zero chance for mistakes. And one last thing that's going on with this is I've cut the mortises for the leg joints. We have the rear leg, rear joint here, and the front joint here. Uh, this is, these have use a fared shoulder joint, I remember I said at the beginning. And this is the shoulder part. We'll get to the fared stuff later, but this is the shoulder part. And this is what a shoulder joint looks like. You have this shoulder that's been cut. You see it right there. And on the front, you see it. The idea here is a leg, that's what we have here. There's a lot of work left to be done on this leg, but it's, it's ready to demonstrate this process at least. We cut a matching data or a slot in the leg that matches the shoulder dimensions and width and height and everything and it should fits in there just like a glove perfect fit okay and that means the weight the load of the chair is borne on the bottom of this shoulder joint it's a very very strong joint now the front one is all is all perpendicular square so is this one right here but if you look at the end one here there's a bit of an angle to it that's because these legs don't sit straight up and down on the rear. The rear legs are canted at an angle so that the top is wider than the bottom. It gives it a nice graceful lines to the chair. Um, the angle of the shoulder face is achieved with the way you put it through the table saw. That's not a big deal. But these, the, the, the rabbits, with the matching angle to them would be very, very hard to do under conventional means. But I have a set of router bits. Cut this with a router. And I have a set of router bits that are made especially for this chair design. They have five degree angles to them. So you see there, this is a negative five degrees and this is a positive five degrees. Get them in the light there so you can see them. Okay, you use the negative on the top bit rabbit and use the positive on the bottom rabbit and you get this nice perfect perfect angled shoulder so that's basically it for the basics of the seats construction I'm going to glue this up let it sit for about 24 hours make it super solid and then we're gonna then we're gonna proceed with the sculpting of the seat and that's where it gets that's where it gets really interesting so. okay so I glued up the seat blank let it dry overnight 24 hours uh, there's a lot of glue squeeze out because you know, basically I went really bonkers with the glue but better too much than too little. I mean, it'll, it'll be all gone when this suit is done. It'll be all cleaned up. So um, now we move on to the most enjoyable part of making a chair, carving the seat. Uh, when you carve a seat, you basically have two options, uh, power carving or hand carving. Uh, Quality-wise, it makes no difference. You can get excellent results with either approach. So it really comes down to uh, a, a matter of personal preference on the part of the craftsman. Um, but the concept is the same for both as well. Uh, you generally start with a really aggressive tool that removes a lot of wood really fast. And then you move through a series of tools that get decreasingly aggressive and increasingly refined. So power carving, the aggressive tool is this. This is what you'd start with. It's an angle grinder see plumbers use these and everything, but it has a special cutting head on it. Um, it's kind of curved and uh, has these burr teeth on it. It's, it's basically like super aggressive sandpaper. This is probably the least aggressive head for power carvers. Uh, you can get more aggressive. You can get a head that's shaped like this, but instead of burr teeth, they have uh, contoured blades. Okay, and even further down that line, you can get a special cutting head that basically turns this thing into a miniature chainsaw, which removes wood at a scary fast rate. I don't use this that much. I use this when I come across a knot in the wood or something that I can't hand carve, because I, I prefer hand carving. 
why do I not like power carbon? Uh, basically two reasons. One, it makes a huge mess. All my machines in my shop, they're connected to dust collectors and you can all remediate all the dust that they create and keep it out of the air. But you can't do that with one of these. None of those methods work. Uh, power carbon's joke, they say dust collection, it's a broom. <laughs> but I use this thing and it just gets dust everywhere. It just, it's all over my machinery and my tools and the floor and the counters and everything. It's just in the air and you know, it's just horrible. horrible. So I avoid it. Um, shops that do a lot of this stuff generally have a special room, uh, you know, a shaping room uh, where they do this kind of stuff. And it's got nothing in it. It's got a table and a big honking exhaust fan in the wall. That's it. So I don't have that luxury. I have a really small shop. The other reason I don't like it is I just don't think it's very, it's not very pleasant. It's not fun. Besides all the dust in the, in the air and everything, it's just, it's noisy. It's, it's it's not my cup of tea, all right? I prefer hand carving. And hand carving, the aggressive tool you start with is one of these. All right, this is uh, an ads. Um, now, in the American tradition of chair making, they generally use large ads, full length ads, you know, with a full length handle and a big, bigger, heavier cutting head. And uh, they, they, they put the seat blank on the floor and stand on it hold it in place and then they wail away at it with the with the ads. Um, that's kind of outside my comfort zone. You're swinging a, a heavy razor sharp cutting tool in the direction of my legs and feet. So I prefer the European approach which is a smaller handheld you know what the, what's called a carving ads and you put the seat blank you clamp it in this bracket here and before you start I, I'll drill a, a couple of holes about three quarters of an inch deep those are my depth gauges, you know, basically when you reach the bottom of those holes, stop digging, all right. Um, power carving does have one advantage, and that is you can, you can carve just about any kind of wood you can throw at it. I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't care. Uh, Sam Maloof's shop, he's a famous chair maker, Sam Maloof, it's this chair design is based on, is, um, he, he, his shop is a power carving shop. And, he made chairs out of bingo and stuff. Like really hard, dense, beautiful, rich, exotic woods. Um, and he made chairs, you know, walnut, cherry, all kinds of stuff. But he, 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 it didn't matter. He could make a chair out of anything. Uh, but when you hand carve, you tend to avoid woods like that because they're really dense and they're really hard to carve and you get a real workout. Um, for Traditionally, the woods that traditional chair makers used for carving seats was pine, were pine and poplar, very soft woods. Um, they wouldn't use a wood like oak or ash. I mean, only a lunatic would use ash for a seat. It's they make baseball bats out of it. It's really hard wood. Um, however, I have Sapili here, and I kind of had this idea because Sapili is technically an exotic wood. But it's like mahogany, it has really, really high working qualities. It's really renowned for that. I've used it before in cabinet making and furniture, not chairs. And it's beautiful wood. It works really beautifully and easily, and it's, it's just very uh, uh, resilient and forgiving. Um, but I've never carved it. I never really thought about it when I got this. I kind of like did a, a went just, just went spacey on it. I didn't even think about it. But when I lift this blank, it's clearly heavier than the blanks I've done out of walnut or cherry. Um, I carved a seat out of butternut once. I don't recommend it. Carved so easy to carve. Easiest wood, cuts like butter. <laughs> Who would have thought? But it's too soft. It doesn't hold up. It's a terrible wood for a chair. But this stuff, I don't know. I think I might have set myself for, for a lot of work. I think this, this, well, I'll let you know. I mean, when we're further on, the, after I've gone at this with the ads, maybe the next duel, I'll have a real idea of what I've set myself up for. But um, we'll see. <laughs> In any case, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be a lovely chair. So I'm going to, I'm going to set to work on this. And when I've hogged out all the wood with the ads this from the center of the seat, uh, we'll be back and we'll move on to the next tool of the series, okay? Okay, so I have finished with the ads. 
and I have hogged out quite a lot of material here. The camera doesn't really do it justice, uh, but it has. Re I have removed quite a lot of wood. Um, you can see, as we expected, it's quite a rough surface. You'll also notice that I didn't go too close to the outline, like it's a good inch away. And these are the depth holes I, I drilled. They're three, they were three quarters of an inch deep. I have not reached the bottom of those holes, all right? The reason is, is you don't go for the bottom of the holes. You don't go close to the edge with the ads because the ads is not a precision instrument. It's, it's a blunt instrument. And uh, it's easy to miss hit a little bit with it. It's easy to miss hit by a half inch or so. So if you go too close to the edge, you could accidentally go beyond the edge and hit here, here, or here. These are the parts of the chair that are going to be flat. And if you hit them with the ads, that's it. It's ruined. It's done. You've got to start over. So don't risk it. Don't go too close. Um, I'll go close to the edge with the next tool. And the next tool is this. It's called a scorp. Um, it's an odd word. Uh, that's the American term for it. I've always thought it was kind of odd. If it's a little too odd for you, it sounds like some kind of Klingon swear word or something. Uh, you could use the British term for it, which is uh, in shape. It's a traditional tool, traditional to coopers and chair makers, and it's designed explicitly for carving out the concave surfaces. Now, people who don't know any better assume you just go with the grain when you use it, so you go this way. Um, that's true, you go with the grain when you're carving wood, like, like if you're whittling or something like that, but if it wouldn't serve you very well here. Uh, as long as you're going downhill, it would cut just fine, but the moment you bottom out and start going uphill into the concave shape, you're going to start getting tear out. And tear out is really bad uh, for this kind of thing. Uh, it just, it can ruin a, a seat. Uh, the only fix for tear out is you got to go deeper. And if tear out occurs uh, really badly, and you, or, or if it occurs late in the process, when the chair is approaching its final shape, you could end up having to go so deep to fix the tear out that you lose the optimal shape of the chair. Um, I suppose if you really screwed up, you don't want them to go so deep you start running out of chair, but you know, I don't think that's that likely. That's kind of crazy. But in order to avoid it, you don't use the tool with the grain. You go across the grain this way. It's like you use a high quality tool with high quality steel that hold, takes a really good edge and holds it for a nice long time. And you can turn the, th turn the scorp this way or that to favor grain in one direction or another as you, as you go. Uh, you can do that because you're paying attention to the wood. Remember I said I liked hand carving because the way it puts you in touch with the material. If, you, um, if you're power carving, you, don't, you just go. I mean, you just bore through this. It doesn't matter. But when you're hand carving, you've got to pay attention. Uh, the wood's going to tell you how it wants to be cut. You just have to listen and pay attention and it'll do what it wants to do. If you fight the wood, you're going to, get, you're going to be disappointed. So I'm going to finish, I'm going to, I'm going to finish this bowl shape. And we're going to go for the bowl shape. I'm not going to worry about this front part and the tr transition from the bowl to the front part. That'll come later. Right now I'm just going for a nice bowl shape that's reasonably close to the edges. Not, I'm not going to go right up to them yet. Oh, that'll be the, with the next tool. I'm also, I'm also going to reach the bottom of these depth gauges. And this, it'll still be a little rough, but it'll, be a, it'll look like a bowl shape when I'm done. And then we'll move on to the next tool. Okay, so I have finished with the scorp. I normally take it a little bit further with the uh, in shape, but the grain in a couple of places is really having a tendency to want to tear out, like right here and right here. So I'm just going to go ahead and transition to the next tool, which offers a little more control, uh, and it's not as aggressive. It takes less, it just takes less wood each time. So each pass, so it's uh, probably better, it'll be easier to work this tough wood with it. It's called a Travisher. I have two kinds. There's this kind and this kind. This, normally this design is what you typically see in the U.S. This is more of a European design, but both are perfectly fine. And um, a Travisher is a tool unique to chair making, as far as I know. I don't know of anyone else who uses them. It's, this is basically a kidney-shaped piece of cherry with a forged blade with a matching curve in it, inset in it. And you just 
lock it in place with the blade sticking out a little bit and you push it through the wood. It uh, offers a lot of control, a lot of finesse. And it's, it's kind of a un unique tool. It's like a plane, but it isn't. It's like a spoke shave, but it isn't. It's like a whittling knife, but it isn't. You know, it's, it's different. It's unique. Uh, this is a, a design you see more often in the US. I have two of them because this is a standard radius, about four inch radius. This is a 12 inch radius. So for the leveler parts of the chair, this is more efficient. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and work this a little bit. I mean, it looks like this, you need like that. And it just takes a little shaving of wood each time. This, what I like about this one is you can control the depth of the cut by adjusting the blade. And so initially I'll, I'll make it a little more aggressive until I get the shape closer to what I want. Then I'll back it off to what I would consider a finishing height. So I'm going to go ahead and work that until I have this bowl shape nice and refined. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about the front part of the chair. All right. So I finished with the traverser for now. Um, there's still a bunch of work to do. It's still a little rough. But I like the bowl shape. Of the, I, I have a nice bowl shape and I'm pretty happy with it. I like to establish the basic geometry of the seat uh, before I worry about refining the surface. And the bowl is good, so the next step is the front profile. Um, I've already cut out the profile, the basic profile of the seat, but there's also the profile of the, of the scallops. The, I've got a high and a low. The, um, the seat has the left edge and the pommel, and it's scalloped out, it's scooped out on both, for the sitter's legs to provide comfort. As I said, I have a high and a low. Basically, I'll, I'll take it to the high one first, and if it looks right, I'll stop there, but if I think it needs to go a little lower, I'll, I'll just keep going. Uh, that's the way these work. I just sort of do it by feel, work it, bring your hands over it, step back, look at it, and make a decision. Um, I've left the edges in place. Those will stay until the very, until much later in the process. Um, the, the, the tool for the, the aggressive tool for the concave surface was the ads. But the aggressive tool for the edges and the uh, convex surfaces is a draw knife. It's a rather scary tool, actually. It's a big, long, exposed, razor-sharp blade. Um, that's the aggressive tool. A more refined tool for those parts would be a spoke shave. And I'll also be bouncing back and forth between those tools and the in-shave and the travisher. Uh, it's just a lot of jumping around based upon what part of the chair you're working on. Um, I'm not going to stop and, and pause at those points. I'm going to basically get this, the seat finished and uh, then be back. And I'll point out some of the refiner things I did on the seat, some of the things that, that are critical to the construction of the chair. And then we'll move on to the next step. Okay, so I've done quite a lot of work to the seat. The seat is basically finished and ready, ready for attaching the legs. Um, it has a nice, beautiful bowl shape. Uh, it has a nice transition to the front edge, nice and gradual, smooth curve. Should be very comfortable. The finish, the front is very refined. There's a little bit of sanding left to do here, but the, it's been cur curved up underneath to give it a nice line. Um, I have knocked off the facets that were formed by the blocks that form the seat. Uh, it's giving this nice smooth curve. Same on the underside. Remember this would have had facets, flat pieces of wood, forming a, a, the basis of a curve. I've knocked off the peaks, forming a nice curve. Uh, I have put roundovers on the underside of the seat, up near to, but not right up to the joints. You leave a little excess wood there because you need it to finish the fair joints. So the seat is basically ready to go. I've also prepared the legs. Here is the rear leg. It sits on the right side of the chair here. The seat attaches here. The, uh, the, the, the rabbits for the leg joint have been finished. A uh, nice five degree angle there. Um, I have taken off excess wood on the inside, leaving a little bit extra here for forming the fair joint. Um, I have put roundovers in strategic places per the design of the chair. Uh, I've drilled, I've, I've made the front legs as well, um, turned on a lathe, leaving a lot of excess wood for the fair joint where it attaches to the seat. 
I have uh, cut this at a slight angle at the top. This will accept the arm of the chair. A uh, hole has been drilled. hole has been drilled on the bottom where the rocker attaches. The rocker and the arm will attach via dowels. I've also drilled uh, on all the legs these, uh, these holes, which will accept screws that reinforce the joint to the chair. And they will be plugged with a contrasting wood, like a dark wood. Um, that'll give a little bit of a visual splash to the chair. So uh, shortly I'm going to move on and attach these legs and we'll be ready to move on to the um, finishing of the joints. But before I do that, I'll just go on record and say, Sapili, <laughs> tough, tough wood to carve. <laughs> it's very hard wood. I probably will not attempt to cut a chair out of Sapili. Uh, it is, was, I was able to do all of this with hand carving um, but when I got to the front here and started using the draw knife, pulling it crosswise through the grain, it was just too hard. It was like I was pulling so hard, I realized that um, I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to slip. I'm going to hurt myself. So I put it away and I pulled out the uh, angle grinder with the burr cutting head. And yeah, it makes quick work of it. No, just no, <laughs> no secret why production shops use it. It goes a lot faster. Uh, but man, I get sawdust everywhere. It was just a mess. But the end result's very nice, and I only used it here and here. Everything else was was done with hand carving. Um, but it came out really nice. It's gonna look really good. So uh, we'll be back when the legs are attached, and we'll move on. Okay, so it's beginning to look like a chair. I glued the legs on. And you might be looking at it thinking it's sitting a little close to the floor, but remember, it's going to have rockers on it. It's going to sit on some rockers, which is going to raise it a little higher off the floor. Um, so the, the, the next step for the joints is I'm going to be sinking some screws to reinforce them. And I'll eventually be plugging these holes. I won't do it right away. I want to remove some of this wood first, but I'll eventually be plugging these holes with a dark contrasting wood. I'm going to be using a wenge which is a very dark wood, almost black. It's often used as a substitute for ebony. I won't use ebony, because ebony is a critically endangered species. I don't think anyone should be using it. Um, but after the, the screws have reinforced the joints, I'll begin shaping them. And you shape the joints the same way, similar in how you carve a seat. You start with an aggressive tool, and then you move through a series of more refined tools. The aggressive tool that I use is this. It's called a Fordham Power Carver. It's, it's a tool used by uh, sculptors, typically. Um, this is about as aggressive a you know, cutting bit as you can get for one of these things. So typically, they're more refined for more detailed work. Um, I get the bulk of the wood off with this thing. And once I start getting close, I will transition to something like this. This is called a hand-stitched rasp. A hand stitched means the teeth have been put on by a craftsman one at a time by hand. Um, why such a fussy tool? Well, because it works. Uh, if you've ever bought a rasp, a mass produced rasp at a big box store, you've probably noticed they don't work. Craftsmen get them all the time and they use them, they get disgusted with them, and they throw them in a drawer and they collect dust. You know, they never use them. These work. I have two of them. I have a cabinet maker rasp and a rat tail rasp. When I'm done with these, the joint is basically shaped. It's just so then I will put like a little sanding drum on this thing and sand them up. And then the rest of the sanding is handwork. And when I'm done with that, these joints will be finished. And we'll be back to move on to the next step. Okay. So the joints have been shaped. Um, they're not finished. There's some remaining work left to do, some of the, 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 some refining of the shape, refining of the surface, but we'll get back to that later. For now, they're good for moving on. The basic shapes are in place. Um, as we go through this chair build video, um, pausing at these milestones, what we're skipping over is a whole bunch of work. Um, these joints are extremely labor intensive and painstaking to create especially the front ones. You remember, the, there's no margin of error on this joint, and remember there was a big hunk of wood here that has to be removed to arrive at this shape. It's mostly handwork, and there's no margin for error. 
uh, you can't rush it because if you gouge too deep, uh, you ruin the joint. If you ruin the joint, you ruin the chair, and all this work will have been for naught. So, painstaking, careful labor. But they're good now. They're good to move on. So we're going to move on to the arms. This is one right here. Profiled. It's been cut to profile, but it's one and three quarter inches thick. Just like every other part on this chair starts at one and three quarter inches in thickness. Uh, why so thick? Because I need the full thickness up here at the end where the arm meets the back post in order to create the fair joint. I'll also need a, a bunch of wood here, right here, untouched, where it meets the post for a nice fair joint under there. I don't need the rest of the thickness. So a power carver would just attach this to the chair and then shape it right on the chair with their power tools. But I don't, I don't power carve, so I'm going to shape most of this by hand before it's attached to the chair. I will leave I will leave a big hunk of wood here at the end, but the rest of it on the bandsaw, I'll just remove about three eighths of an inch right, up, right down the top. And I'll do the same on the bottom, except for this area here, I'll leave some wood untouched there for the joint here. That'll leave it to be about one inch thick. Now then there's a shaping of the edges to do, rounding them off. Uh, I'll do a nice taper under on the underside of the chair so that when you're sitting in the chair, there's a nice taper that feels good on your fingers as you wrap your hands around the, the arm. There will also, the arm will be scalloped here, scooped out on the inside so that there's a nice, comfortable, natural shape for your arm to rest as you're sitting in the chair. Um, a lot of shaping to do. I'm going to get, it'll be almost done before it's attached to the chair. I'll have it sanded to about, shaped and sanded to about 100, 120 grit before I even attach it to the chair. Okay? So, I'm going to proceed with that, and then we'll be back. Okay, so it's really looking pretty good now. I'm really liking the, 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 the way it's coming out. Um, the arms have been finished, fully shaped, nice slim profile to them. Uh, they have been attached to the chair with the fair joint where it attaches to the beer post finished. The fair joint where it attaches to the front leg under here is finished. Everything's been, the whole chair's been sanded to a nice high grid of about 320. And we're ready to move on to the next step. This is the wood for the headboard. And um, you're seeing a pattern at this point, I'm sure. It's starting out, it's one and three quarter inches thick. Uh, I will cut it to fit. And then I'll shape the bulk of it off the chair. I'll leave the ends of it unfinished because the ends of it will be finished after it's attached to the chair and finished, so there's a smooth transition between the post and the headboard. The styles require a bunch of working to get them to fit perfectly. So after I have the headboard mostly finished and after I have the styles to show you, we'll be back and we'll talk more about that. Okay, we're ready to begin assembling the back of the chair. Um, the styles have been finished. They are sanded to 400 grit, which is the final surface. Uh, the deck of the chair and the insides of these posts have also been sanded to 400 grit. And the underside, the bottom of the headboard, has been sanded to 400 grit, the final surface. The reason you do that is because once it's all attached, you can't get at the stuff effectively. It's, it's, it's too difficult to try to sand in there. So you get it all sanded before you glue it all up. You'll notice that the uh, headboard, although the bottom is finished, the rest of it's quite rough um, because you have to shape it when it's on the chair in order to get a nice harmonious uh, transition from the posts to the headboard. Uh, there's a lot of wood to remove from it to do that. Um, it's one area where I do use a power tool. I use a orbital sander with a vacuum attached and an extremely coarse grip pad, like a 25 grip pad. It removes wood quite quickly. Um, and because it's got a vacuum attached, it doesn't get sawdust everywhere, which is the bane of power carving normally. So some people think that you use wood glue everywhere with wood furniture, but in this case, we're not. We're going to use epoxy. The reason is wood glue gets its strength from curing under compression. That's why 
uh, when you glue things with blue glue, you always clamp them. Uh, but you can't clamp this. I mean, these, these things fit like they fit. There's no, the, the pressure is what the pressure is. And it's not high pressure because if you make it too snug, you can't get them in there. Um, so, wood glue would not be very effective here. So we'll use epoxy. It's a two-part epoxy tearing foot long cure. It's very strong. So I'm going to go ahead and proceed with that. And we'll be back after I'm done. Okay, so the chair, the back of the chair is finished. The styles are all done and in place. The headboard's all in place. It's been fully shaped. The fair joints have been fully shaped. Uh, the, the screws that hold this in place have been plugged with contrasting plugs. Uh, it's, it's, it's done back there. It's ready. We're ready to move on to the last phase of the construction of the chair, and that is uh, the rockers. We have to craft the rockers. Um, they're a long curved piece and they're load bearing, so they have to be very strong. There's basically three ways to do a curved construct in wood. You could, we could just cut them straight out of a piece of lumber in curved form. It's fast and easy, but it's also very wasteful, and it's the weakest of the three constructs, so it's not a very good candidate for this application. The second approach would be steam bending. That's a traditional technique, and when it's done right, when the wood is sourced correctly and it's done right, you reserve, it results in a nice strong curved construct, perfectly suitable for this application. But um, steam bending poses some logistical challenges for me, so I don't do it very often. I usually resort to the third method, which is lamination. You take a bunch of strips that are nice and uniform in thickness, and nice and smooth on both sides, and you stack them up, and you, you slather some glue in there, and, and you uh, clamp them to a form. And when the glue cures, they retain the shape of the form in what is the strongest of the three constructs. This is stronger than steam bending. Um, so it's a really good uh, method to use for this. Uh, there's a lot of work left to do here. First of all, I have to add some additional laminates, stack up to create pedestals where the legs attach, so I have some extra wood to fabricate the fair joints. The other thing I have to do is, um, this is, these are 10 strips, 1 8 of an inch thick, so it adds up to 1 and a quarter inch in height. Uh, I have to mill it down so it's 1 and a quarter inch in width. I can then take a 5 8 inch roundover bit in a router, and with four passes, turn this into a 1 and quarter inch diameter cylinder, per the design of the chair. Um, there's a bunch of other things that after, afterwards to, to fit it to the chair. There's a bunch of tuning that has to be done to the legs to get them to perfectly mate, with, perfectly seamlessly mate with the, with the rockers. Um, they'll be uh, finishing the fair joints, they'll be finishing the front tip and the rear tip in a nice elegant shape. So a lot of work there left to do. And I'm not going to videotape it, so that's more of that watching paint dry kind of feeling. I'm not going to put you through it. We'll be back when they're done and they're attached to the chair and we're ready to move on to the finishing, which I'll have a few words to say. Before we do that, I have a few words to say about uh, the use of screws here, because I know that some woodworker is going to come along and see this video on <laughs> online and they're going to throw a fit and put all kinds of comments in there about, oh, I shouldn't have used screws, I should have just done pure joinery. And uh, because the, in the small community of craftsmen who make chairs like this, there's this controversy about it. some people use screws, some say you should never use screws, you should just use pure joinery, because if the joint's done right, it's plenty strong enough on its own, which is true. But um, screws do add some extra strength. And basically, I came to these, this position on my own, and then I read an interview of Sam Maloof, who had the same viewpoint as I did, which is kind of affirming. Sam Maloof is the legendary woodworker who basically pioneered this design and became quite famous for it. And he said, the way he put it in his interview was, when he first started making these chairs, he didn't use screws. And he thought about it a bit, and he, he realized that he wasn't making chairs for his clients, he was making them for his clients' grandchildren. And these are heirloom pieces of furniture. So anything that increases the longevity of the joints, was fine by him, so he started using screws. 
and he plugged them with wood of the same type, basically camouflaging the, the holes. Um, and then he thought about it more, and he realized, it occurred to him, that it, these joints are beautiful. I mean, they're, they're, they're part of the design of the chair, the visual appeal of the chair. So why not call attention to them? So he started using contrasting plugs as an accent. And I have the same opinion. I, I do the same thing. Uh, I use contrasting plugs everywhere I want to do a visual accent. So the, the four legs and the, where the headboard joins up. There's two I don't use a contrasting plug, though. Because I just don't think it makes sense to make it a visual focal point. And that's right here. There's a screw going through the post and into the arm to reinforce this joint. Um, I don't think this is, like I said, I don't think this is a sensible place to make a visual focal point, so I use a, a non-contrasting plug there so it doesn't draw attention to it. It's, it's ironic that um, I do that there because these joints, as I've already explained, these, these screws here, they're nice to haves, all right? But this isn't, this screw really is necessary because this is end, this arm meeting here, this is end grain glued to side grain and uh, because of the mechanics of the way wood glue works and wood end grain does not an end grain glue up does not make a strong joint it's it just doesn't so the screw is really there necessary to reinforce that joint without it this joint would probably fail in a, in a pretty disappointing sh period, short period of time but the screw reinforces it makes it a nice long life joint um, so that's my opinion on this. Uh, for chairmakers who disagree with me, well, they can make their own chair. So, the build is finished. The rockers are done. They have a nice tubular shape. They've been attached with a nice finished fair joint. The ends have pleasing shapes to them. The whole chair has been sanded to about 400 grit. It's got a beautiful, satiny, smooth feel to it. Uh, it's, it's all that's left to do is the finish. So in woodworking, there's basically two kinds of finishes. There's film finishes and penetrating finishes. A film finish is just that. It forms a film on the surface of the material. Uh, examples of film finishes are polyurethane or lacquer or schlack or uh, varnish. Um, when it's done right, a film finish is quite durable and it looks great. I mean, it just it makes the wood come alive. It really pops. But uh, the one downside to a film finish is they have a plasticky feel to them, which I think disqualifies them for use in chairs. Um, a, chair, a quality chair has several properties to it. Um, it needs to be comfortable, naturally. <laughs> it needs to look good. Uh, it needs to be strong and relatively light. And I believe a chair needs to have a tactile quality to it because you're in such close contact with the chair. Um, a film finish would get in the way of that, you know? For desks and chest of drawers, fine, go for the look. But for a chair, you need to use a penetrating finish. A penetrating finish penetrates into the wood, it soaks into the wood and bonds with the wood. Um, it's not as durable as a film finish, but it does leave a beautiful, a smooth, warm wood surface. Feels like wood. Feels great. Uh, when people sit in my chairs, they tend to run their hands up and down the arms. No one has to suggest they do this. They just, it just happens. They just do it without fail because it feels so good. You know, it just has this beautiful, soft feel to it. Um, you get that with the penetrating finish. And I've looked far and wide for a penetrating finish I was truly happy with. Tried a bunch. Tried some formulations that you make yourself, some store-bought kind. I, I've tried everything. I was always unhappy with them for one reason or another, but until I found this one particular product from Germany called Osmo Pollux Oil. It's, um, it was originally made for wood floors, but it works great on furniture. Um, it's a blend of three natural oils and two waxes. It's like a safflower oil, soy oil, and thistle oil. Who knew that was a thing, right? Thistle oil. And then the two at Carnuba Wax and there's one that I can't remember. Um, it's, it's quite pricey. But I think it's worth it because I, you get a look and a feel that I haven't seen with any other finish. That's what I've settled on using. So I'm going to apply that to this chair, and when I'm done, we'll be back to 
look over the completely finished chair, and I'll have some final thoughts. So, the chair is finished, and it came out nice. I'm really pleased with the result. The, the finish has a nice satiny feel to it, and the sapili has a nice deep, rich red color to it. It also exhibits a property known as chatoyancy, uh, which is something sapili is known for, and some other woods as well, of course. Uh, it's sometimes called the tiger eye effect. Uh, it's, it's when the light plays across the wood, the tonality of the grain shifts, changes, it flips. Light goes to dark and dark goes to light. It gives it an iridescent quality that's really quite striking. The chair also is quite comfortable, uh, far more comfortable than most people would think a solid wood chair is a right to be. Now, you're not going to find a chair like this in any store. I, it's, they're just not mass produced. I make Windsor chairs as well. And my Windsor chairs, Windsor chairs are really quite beautiful. Um, but you can go to a big box furniture store and you can buy a Windsor chair. I know, compared to mine, they're nothing, but still, you can buy one. And the reason is quite simple. Uh, the architecture of a Windsor chair is very conducive to mass production. But the design of this chair defies mass production. Now, I'm sure if an engineer, clever engineer, worked a problem long enough, they could come up with a way to mass produce these organically shaped joints. But I doubt they'd be as nice as the hand-shaped ones. And I also doubt they could sell the chair for much less than I sell mine for. So, uh, not really much of a business model there, given the limited marketplace. So, I, I, no one mass produces these. The only place you can get chairs like these are from a craftsman who lovingly makes them from scratch. Is it expensive? Yeah, it's expensive. Is it worth it? Yeah, it's worth it. If this video has made anything clear, it's the amount of craftsmanship and skill and labor that goes into making one of these. I can't sell them for any less. It's not worth my time. And I don't think it's a luxury per se. I mean, we live in a throwaway society where you go out and you buy something, a, a piece of furniture or an appliance or what have you and, you, and after a few years it breaks and you throw it away and you buy a new one. It's very wasteful. It's very impersonal. But this is very personal indeed. This you feel the hand of the maker in this piece of furniture. It's unique. It's, it's special. And I think it's important to surround ourselves with that sort of thing these days. So, if you can afford it, reach out to me. And maybe I can make you one of these. Now, I'm probably not going to make one out of Sapili again. Uh, Sapili, well beautiful, is also quite difficult to work for the way out that I work. But I also make chairs out of walnut, and I make chairs out of cherry. Both are beautiful woods, and they make beautiful chairs. Uh, a lot of craftsmen who make chairs like this will also make them out of maple, which also makes a beautiful chair. Now, I haven't made them out of maple because I don't personally care for maple. It's just personal taste. I prefer, maple's a very light, very blonde wood, and I prefer darker woods. But if you like maple, I can make you a beautiful chair out of maple for you. If you have some other wood in mind, reach out and we'll talk. If it's a wood that's not suitable for a chair or, or is in, too unusual and may prove impossible to source, I may not be able to accommodate you, but we can talk. I'm always open to exploring new avenues with these. So reach out and maybe I can make you a piece of heirloom furniture.